So, good afternoon. Um, we are extremely happy to see that uh, this plenary is uh, quite full and I'm convinced that uh, when we will have our uh, members uh, here uh, talking about our successes and about our strategy for the next uh, European elections, it will be even more full. Uh, my name is Vula Cezzi. I'm the Secretary General of the Greens in the European Parliament and uh, this session is planned for one hour in order to allow you and to give you the possibility uh, to know why this group of 6% in the European Parliament have an impact a much higher impact than the 6%, where this group made the difference, and what are our successes, our fights, and how we are preparing the next European elections, which are extremely important and on which we need really to work very closely in order to make sure that we will have a bigger group, a more influential group in a political context, which is very difficult, but as you will see after this plenary, we will manage and we will be very successful. So, I would like uh, only to uh, explain to you how we will organize the session because we, it is, uh, we have exactly 45 minutes and uh, we will start with uh, the keynote speech of our co-president Philippe Lambert, uh, which uh, he will uh, practically introduce the debate and he will explain uh, uh, everything to you. After that, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, MEPs of our group which they will use uh, uh, this uh, occasion to explain to you very briefly the main successes and the May challenges for them. And uh, after that, we will open the floor for a few questions. And if we really respect the time, we will have the possibility to conclude by 3.30, 3.40, which is de facto the momentum of uh, this afternoon. So I immediately take my seat. And Philippe, you are welcome. Well. Thank you for a full room. Well, there were more people, I think, on the day I addressed Emmanuel Macron in the plenary a few months ago. But OK, I think you won't be disappointed, I promise. Dear friends, it's really good to be back at the European Green Party. I must admit that I have skipped a few council meetings of late, but I know that the party has been in very good hands since I left the committee now six years ago. Exactly six months from now, the European citizens will once again choose their representatives in a context that gives many causes for concern. Two months ago, the IPCC rang again the alarm bell with renewed determination. In short, avoiding runaway climate change depends on what humanity will do in the next 10 years. Six months before, IPCC's opposite number for biodiversity did exactly the same thing, confronting humanity with its responsibilities in containing the six massive extinction of species. In a word, humankind is making its own planet unlivable. At the same time, even though extreme poverty has been drastically reduced over the last decades, inequality, and not just in terms of income or wealth, inequality is on the rise even in rich countries such as ours. Just imagine, between 20 and 25% of Europeans live at risk, at risk of poverty or social exclusion. Imagine between 100 and 125 million people. To put it bluntly, our economic system has made the world's population as a whole richer than ever before, but it is concentrating that wealth in ever fewer hands and creates it at the expense of the very possibility of human life on this planet. And actually, inequality is driving up our ecological footprint, since the richest 10% produce no less than half of the CO2 we emit. At the same time, the artificial intelligence revolution has the potential of making the rent extraction power of the capital owners, please don't call them too much investors, because they, most of them don't deserve that name, this rent extraction power even great, greater. 
or ecological impact and rising global injustice are the two time bombs that all generation has to defuse. As if this were not enough, the European Union is confronted with the rise of authoritarianism around it, in Russia, in Turkey, in the Middle East, or further afield, like in China, Brazil, the Philippines, or Venezuela. And these regimes are now actively encouraged by a president of the United States who is actively sapping the multilateral, the multilateral world order that together with the EU, the United States spent decades building. An inside our union, under the guise of illiberal democracy, authoritarianism is creeping in as well. And make no mistake about it, yes, the judiciary, the media are being put under political control in Hungary, in Poland, in Romania, etc. But in mature democracies such as Belgium, France, the judiciary is increasingly sidelined, left aside, even when it comes to depriving people of their basic freedoms, all this in the name of fighting terrorism or irregular migration. And what's become of democracy? When because of conflicts of interest or ideological conformism, elected politicians willingly submit to the will of financial and economic lobbies. So the two time bombs, in a way, have been joined by a third one, a time bomb that threatens all democracies and civil liberties. Is it any surprise, then, that anxiety, even anger, are rising among our citizens, like we see in France at the moment, that an increasing number either desert our democratic institutions, refuse to vote, or embrace the national populist insurrections with vengeance? There's no simpler trick in politics to fuel and ride on fear in order, then, in order then for you to present yourself as the savior of the people. That is the recipe of the national populists of all kinds. And yes, they are on the rise across Europe. And too often, the response of the traditional parties in Europe, and I think especially of the European People's Party, has been twofold. On the one hand, they are joining the national populists in making migration the defining issue of all times, scapegoating the often Muslim migrant as the major threat to our culture, our economic balance, our social protection systems, or jobs. They use migrants, though, as a decoy to steer attention away from the main course, that is, economic policy. On that front, what do they offer? Just more of the same. Under cover of better regulation, more deregulation of product and labor markets, more free trade deals aimed at putting our social, environmental, sanitary, or taxation standards under pressure, and an increased resistance to set ambitious environmental targets or banning toxic products. All this because it puts corporate profits, corporate rent extraction under threat. And if citizens don't agree, their reaction is, well, they don't understand us. Let us better explain our policies. Because of course, what is good for Volkswagen is good for Germany. What is good for BNP Paribas is good for France, and so on and so forth. The friends, in a way, Emmanuel Macron is right. The next European election will pit the progressives against the national populists. But the contest will not be, as Macron would have it, between himself on one side and Salvini and Orban on the other. No. The choice will be between the real progressives, that is us, and the national populists, as to who offers the most credible and desirable alternative to the mainstream political forces defending neoliberal globalization, a project that Emmanuel Macron embodies all too well. Dear friends, History teaches us that massive financial and economic crises beget national populism. But let's not think that Europe is doomed to fall again prey to yesterday's demons. The worst is never certain. Yes, national populism is on the rise, and as one in Hungary, in Italy, in Poland, in Romania, and elsewhere, and one might even say in the Brexit referendum. But it has been held in check 
in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, and so many other places. So I don't know whether you know this, I'm a Star Wars fan, and unlike Han Solo, I have a good feeling about this. Look at what happened on October the 14th in Bavaria, in Belgium, in Luxembourg. The Green Wave rose as the other alternative to the absolute rule of short-term profit for the happy few at the expense of others and our planet. Neoliberalism puts the ego, me, myself, and I, or in a more pseudo-scientific terms, the homo economicus, maximizing his own interest, at the top and center of everything. In their own way, the national populists bring back the we in the equation. But it's a we that excludes, a we that opposes the us to the them. As Greens, we also believe that society is more than the sum of its components, of its members. But all response to the neoliberal I is an inclusive we, one that wants to leave no one behind. Everyone, everyone has a right to live a fulfilling life, so says Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is our compass in life and in politics. This is why we fight to preserve our common home, planet Earth. This is why we fight for justice and equality. This is why we fight for civil liberties, rule of law, and democracy. This is why we fight for open societies, able to do their utmost to welcome the people in need. And I choose my words carefully. I say we fight, because these times are not times for a gentle conversation. Dear friends, climate change kills. Exploitation of the planet kills. Pollution kills. Junk food kills. Austerity kills. Poverty kills. Weapons we sell kill. And when they don't, they ruin lives. So yes, the green friends, we fight. But we fight with words. Words that express our indignation against the system based on the limitless exploitation of the planet and of the people. Words that conjure an ambitious vision of a better world where human dignity rather than the drive for profit is central. Words that point to credible solutions to the environmental, social, and democratic challenges of all times. Words that radiate determination and enthusiasm Words that invite change makers to join hands and build together a world where no one, no one is left behind. Thank you. A world where we invite these change makers to engage on a path of change in which everyone, everyone can participate and from which everyone can benefit. But you know, words are not enough. In the battle of ideas, they count, but they need to be backed up by action. And there, as legislators or as executives at European, national, regional, or local level, we Greens are demonstrating day in, day out, that when there's a will, there's a way. During this hour, a handful of my Green colleagues, they will come soon on stage, will just illustrate that. Of course, Change is never wide, deep, or fast enough to our taste, but it is never, never for lack of engagement by the Greens. So let's, uh, let's be proud of the values we are rooted in, of the vision we have for society, of the solutions we promote, of the alliances we build, and of our achievements. For decades, the advocates of the status quo, as well as the national populists, have derided us as naive idealists disconnected from the hard economic, financial, geopolitical, security realities of our world. Dear friends, I believe that we all sense that an increasing number of our fellow citizens, on the contrary, see in us people who can be trusted to help steer all societies out of the danger zone. Our challenge now is to confirm leverage and amplify our recent successes. I will not deny that in some member states, trust in the Greens has faltered of late. 
but I know that all teams on the ground are doing their utmost to rebuild it. In other member states where we have been marginal at best, political alternatives around our agenda or close to it are being built with our active participation. And where we are strong, the October successes are drawing towards us new positive energies. So, dear friends, we have six months, six months to go. As we say in French, six months is an eternity in politics. Six months is an eternity in politics. And of course, events will intrude. Of course, our successes will make us targets. Of course, we may make mistakes even. But I'm confident that these six months provide us with an unprecedented opportunity to widen our appeal and deepen the trust of our citizens. Let us seize the opportunity. Let us make the green wave the surprise of the 2019 European election. Thank you very much. So I would like to invite um, to take the seat uh, to um, our MEPs. I start with uh, Judith Sargentini, Mrs. Article 7 for Hungary. Um, we have uh, Bart Stas uh, from France, Yannick Jadot. I was looking for Sven, Sven Giegel from Germany. Monica Vanna from Austria and Karima Deli, the only president of a committee, the Transport Committee, we have uh, uh, in the European Parliament. So, uh, if you allow me, I would like to put a few questions to uh, our MEPs, and uh, some of them they have been prepared, some of them I think I will improvise because I would like to practically uh, make some surprises. Uh, but uh, it will not be either a surprise if we start with Judith uh, Sargentini. Uh, knowing that Judith became a real famous person all over Europe. And I must say also that uh, once I saw a an, an sarcastic video in Holland uh, uh, about, uh, about Judith, which was that moment I thought indeed she became famous. Because, I mean, that is uh, the fact that they took uh, all the time to organize such a video around you. It means that really you uh, make a big difference. So what we would like to know know uh, is um, uh, about your report, how you managed to get the two-thirds majority in this parliament, and tell us not only about Hungary, but a little bit more about the dynamic and the difficulties you got to get this report, but also how you would like to make the follow-up, because this follow-up is extremely important for the future of the European Union, because Article and Article 7 at the European Parliament for the first time with two-thirds majority, obviously you will need and we will need collectively to fight to make it happen at the level of the Council. Judith, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fula. Um, uh, how did I do this? Well, I, when I took this job in, Jul in July 2017, I thought this is a suicide mission. We will never manage to do this because party politics, particularly with the European People's Party, the Christian Democrats, is just too strong. But if we do this right, if we write a report that sets out the facts that cannot be debated, um, if we do not haste it, if we make sure that we're not uh, pro, um, uh, publishing before the Hungarian elections, those took place in April 2018, in order not to suggest that we would be influencing the elections, we could maybe come close to two-thirds, and uh, when we lose, we could say, you see, there's simply no political will. Uh, 
uh, it's not about the content. And I'm very happy to conclude there is political will, and I find this a very positive sign also towards the elections uh, in May 2019, and towards Hungarian citizens that want change or towards citizens in Romania and Poland that, that see that there is a European Union that is there to look after them, or particularly there is a European Parliament. Because although we're proud, although this is something that had to happen, it happened way too late. In 2010, the first change started to take place in Hungary, and people looked away, particularly other member states and the, and the European Commission, they looked away. They thought this will solve itself. They thought it will not go that rapidly. They thought this is sovereignty. But what it actually is, it's taking away basic rights of Hungarians. Your religious freedom, your freedom of association, fair trial, press freedom. In the debate in Hungary, they tried to make this into a migration issue. Let us not be fooled. This is about the protection of, of, of rights of European citizens. And we saw the Polish government and the Romanian government taking their cue from what was possible in Hungary. They saw that other member states looked away. They saw that if you just uh, 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 work smart, you hire a lot of lawyers, you argue, well, in the, in the German constitution they, they say this, and at the Dutch we, we took that. If they do it smart, if you stay silent, it can happen, because member states are shy to respond to each other. And that's a huge mistake. So, thank you for the compliments, and um, it is not necessarily nice to be famous because I've done something that should have happened eight years ago. Thank you, uh, Judith. Uh, I think that the difficulties on, you know, when it comes to your report, they started even before you got the report. I mean, from getting the report to getting adopted the report and to really be the person which politically will fight for the follow-up, of course, with the necessary majorities. There is a lot of work behind, but I think that this is one of the biggest success of the group during this legislature. Nobody thought that the group with 6% of the MEPs will manage to organize in such an obstyle uh, environment the two-third majorities, and we really need an extra applause because this is one of the biggest well, no. really moments that we have. I thought I, I'll save you the time, but uh, what I think it shows is that uh, a smaller party, not in the center of power, but on the outskirts with a clear ideology, can actually make a difference and put forward proposals that get indeed a two-third majority. And it might sound strange in this room, but I think we should look at this as what we think about rule of law in the European Parliament has become mainstream. We are and people don't like that, but we're middle of the road. And I'm not talking about the sort of music, because I don't like middle of the road music, but I mean to say what we say is not extreme. What Orban is doing, that's extreme. Thank you. So um, now I would like to come to Sven. Uh, so, uh, well, I will make him a compliment, which I'm not sure he will take it as a compliment, but doesn't matter, because uh, Sven is uh, the man who creates trouble. So, all political groups, when we go to the Conference of Presidents and we bring some initiative of Mr. Sven Giegold, they start to say, Sven, mamma mia, because they get nervous. Because Sven, not only he has very good ideas and he's strategic, but also he never gives up. And this is something which 
everybody hates, but internally we very much appreciate, because we know in one way or in the other, he will really manage what he don't get inside to get it with the outside pressure. So a few journalists with a few leaks, with this, with that, and then suddenly you go in the next meeting, in the previous everybody was against, in the next meeting, everybody is on its way to compromise. So I know in, uh, in Italian we have an expression on that, but I will not repeat it because maybe you will not take it very well. But I think it is a real plus to have people with such a persistence. And they are two files which practically uh, they are quite relevant and they have been relevant for this group is the issue of tax justice and uh, the taxation of multinationals and is the question of transparency of the institutions. And we would like, Sven, from you to tell us a little bit about these two things and um, thank you. Okay, after, uh, wow, yeah, exactly. So, uh, first I have to say and apologize because I have to leave a bit earlier to go back to North Rhine-Westphalia where 300 people preparing for the local elections and we need to energize them to help us in the European campaign. So, I hope that you understand that this is my first duty because the first thing from here is to inspire everyone in our parties to truly campaign in the European elections. I think for us, this is a top priority uh, after this day. So, um, beyond that, well, I, it's true. I, I'm a certain, um, I have a certain character of stubbornness. In particular, I hate since I'm uh, at, well, at universities, I have a strong dislike of tax havens and of double standards in the rule of law. I think we as Greens should be the ones who defend the rule of law against the powerful who believe that they stand above the law. The law is for everyone and in particular for those who have most of power and most of money. They have to abide again to the rules which we have defined together in democratic ways. And tax havens. And tax havens are just this. And when Juncker was elected, it was clear we have a huge opportunity because he has been the architect of the tax haven of Luxembourg. And we Greens gave him five years of a bad time with our proposals and the international journalists uh, of ICIJ have put the issue again and again with one scandal after the other, Lux Leaks, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, on the top of the agenda. And I'm now proud to say that the combined pressure of media, civil society, and us as Greens and other progressives in the European Parliament have led to the biggest advancement in European politics so far. Because in no other field in the last five years, Europe has done so much legislation in order to close down tax havens, to make sure, Judith was very important in this, that companies are transparent in Europe who are their beneficial owners, that we have a tax haven list which puts pressure to other countries to get transparent as well. And now we have also made two reforms of European money laundering legislation which will make it harder for banks to launder billions and billions of illegal money. So Europe has made progress to close down tax havens. But I promise you we are not yet there. We don't have yet full tax transparency for multinationals. We do not yet have a common tax base. We do not yet have minimum tax rates everywhere in Europe for the multinationals. And I will not rest until also the richest and the biggest corporations pay their fair share. And I'm sure all of us Greens are standing together to defend our welfare state against those who want not to participate in paying their fair share of tax. So, and then the second, we saw it, see it in all committees, in the Environment Committee, in the Trade Committee. Wherever we are, we see the detrimental effects, but on the chemical and food side. We everywhere see the detrimental effect of lobbying by those who have most money against lobbying the interests 
of those who don't have that much money to defend their interests, like the environment, like the poor, and so on. So therefore, it's very simple. All financial activity in politics should be transparent and there should be clear rules. And it's a shame for the European Parliament that lobbyists go in and out our doors and we do not know who is financing them, what are they doing. We want that all political lobbying, regardless for whom, regardless how powerful the interest, has to become fully transparent. We want full lobby transparency and limits to what money and big money can do in politics. This is to defend our democracy against those who try, think they can buy our political institutions, but Europe is not for sale. And that is, <laughs> last sentence, and I, I indeed, and, and most other political parties hate us for this, because they don't want that lobby meetings become transparent. They say this would infringe with the individual freedom of MEPs. I must say it's infringing on the rights of normal citizens that they do not know what big money is doing in politics on the national as well as in the European level. And therefore I'm now proud that we will have a vote in a few weeks time, first in the relevant AFCO committee so, and then in the European Parliament to make lobby transparency binding. There was never such a vote. We were working for five years for it. And now, just in time, right before the elections, everyone will have to say yes or no to binding lobby transparency in the lobby European Parliament. And please help us winning that vote by putting the issue on the agenda in your relevant member state. All MEPs will have to say yes or no we need an absolute majority in Parliament and we will fight for each vote together with Transparency International, with the lobby organizations, with the civil rights uh, organizations, with Friends of the Earth, because all know only with lobby transparency we will be stronger on all the different green fights where we fight against big money. Uh, and therefore, this is a big advancement so in the beginning of December, I hope we have a Christmas present for the Greens and for civil society with binding lobby transparency in the European Parliament. That's the next victory. Thank you, Sven. So for sure, uh, we will be happy. A few other people, they will be unhappy, but we know that we are doing the right thing and that uh, uh, it is important that these changes are done in order also to gain credibility uh, for the EU institutions, because if these reforms, they will not be done, we are really helping populists and anti-Europeans to uh, use these weak parts in order to say that this is elite, this is behind closed doors, this is lobbies, and, uh, uh, and these are multinationals. Thank you very much, and if you have to leave, uh, uh, okay, you take your time. And then I would like to um, just now give the floor to Karima, because Karima, the last two and a half years, have been elected president of the Transport Committee, which is a very powerful, full of lobbies committee uh, and uh, with a lot of legislation. I must say, initially, we were a little bit worried because Karima, she's young, she's dynamic, she's green. And in these committees, of course, we had Michael Kramer, who he did an excellent work, but he was a man. And uh, in these committees, practically, no, not for us, but for the others, in these committees with a lot of lobbies, with a lot of uh, a really power game, uh, I mean, it was to have a green young woman with a lot of energy and also with campaigning mood, it was a challenge. And we would like just to know uh, which uh, have been your achievements and what are your plans till the end of the legislature. Thank you, Vul thank you, Vula. I'm very happy uh, to be with you in Berlin because uh, my big fight in the parliament is air pollution. And here in Berlin, everyone knows uh, what can we do 
to fight air, po to fight air pollution is to promote use of bike. And I would like really in this fight that Mikhail Kramer has led many years here in Berlin, in the European Parliament, and please, I think we call all thanks him for this. Really. I'm very proud because in this history of the European Parliament, the Greens make the first chairwoman in the head of transport committee. Thank you, really. And uh, I will, uh, I will like to know, we Greens are never as strong as when we form the bridge between society and institution. I would like to, to take the example of Dieselgate. First, no one believe in the European Parliament could do nothing, but we did it. Because with the Green, yes, we can. The first step with my colleague Florent Marcellesi, we launched a petition. After only 24 hours, we receive 140,000 signature. It's, it was crazy, but the message is very clear. It is how we can, we, we became, the Greens group became the voice of victim of Volkswagen, Renault, Fiat, and all other car manufacturers. And we have a problem with all of car manufacturers because are lying, are lying. So my question is very clear. Why, we, uh, why are we the voice of the European citizen who want to fight air pollution, the Greens? It's very simple. Because member states don't take it seriously enough this topic, air pollution. That is the reason why. First, the second step is to mobilize. We mobilize NGOs, of course, but also cities where people clearly suffer uh, the consequences of air pollution. We show them that government were shaping in the, them in the back. And we have, in this movement, the biggest cities, Paris, London, Stuttgart now, is very important. And the, in the meantime, we keep the fight to clear air. Together with Pascal Durand, is another French MEP, <coughs> we try to set up a new type approval system to make sure Czech are fully independent for car manufacture. Together with Bas Ekut, I don't know where is Bas Ekut. Where is he? He's voting. Yeah, he's voting. He's yes. candidate. He's candidate. Yeah. <laughs> we fought for low emission mobility with Claude Turms, with Jacob, Jacob Dalunde. We pushed for ambitious CO2 target for car and heavy duty vehicles. But we don't choose about, uh, between climate and health. We fight for climate and health. And I believe when you talk about Greens it's, uh, in the European Parliament, when Greens take action, Europe can make a giant steps. We are the one who, we, who brings so civil society, uh, NGOs, whistleblowers, and in the house to bridge the gap between the real life and the institution. We are the ones to, to protect children and future generations. We are the ones to, to protect planet for you, for me, and everyone. And I believe it is why it must to continue the next year because we can do it now. Thank you.
Thank you, Karima. And uh, I would like just to continue with France because uh, Yannick Jadot is uh, um, an extremely um, influential MEP and important MEP. I'm not asking absolutely nothing, but is the issue is that... Uh, I'm listening really, to you, huh, Vula? Really, so, what? Yes, uh, I know. Uh, so um, you practically have been extremely active on the climate change. And uh, uh, in our days, the climate change is something that most of the political parties are practically uh, discussing and they are claiming you are also in a quite difficult political environment in France because uh, more and more political families they try to say we are also Greens so I would like to ask you also because you are running in the European elections in a key position uh, what are practically the main arguments and the main successes for your work around the climate change and the energy transition that uh, they can help uh, the candidates but also they can help uh, the parties to show that we make the difference. So uh, that is practically my question to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, ready to talk about electric fishing. <laughs> so I thought, after, you know, after. for our Dutch participants, they could start dealing with their emails and uh, something else about except listening to me, uh, because it's a success. You know, the, the issue uh, about today is talking about the successes. So let's be frank, huh? it's uh, uh, maybe 10% of the time we are spending in this parliament, the successes. So the point of the European election is to improve that proportion of successes uh, uh, in our work. So I will move to climate, if you, if you are willing to. Uh, what I think really uh, about climate change is uh, uh, if we uh, write a new page of uh, the European history, it's clearly about climate change. Because climate change, somehow, it's about everything. We are dealing with Putin with an extreme uh, bias, which is importing gas and oil for, from Russia. We are now, you may remember, Juncker going to the US this summer. And without any mandate, without any mandate uh, from the Council or from the Parliament, he said that I commit Europe to import more G soya and to import more shell gas from the US. And we know all the uh, arms sales or oil relationship with the Gulf. So, the first thing about climate change is not only offering a future to our children, it's not only fighting the most dramatic, with biodiversity, but the most dramatic uh, environmental crisis, but it's also developing, offering a new future. It's creating jobs everywhere in all territories. And when we, through the uh, Renewable Directive, we manage to put the, uh, the uh, uh, citizenship uh, 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 energy, the fact that communities will be helped to develop projects on renewables. It's creating economic activities. It's creating jobs on every territory. And when you have economic activities, when you have jobs, you have public services, you have culture, and you have democracy. And in many of our territories in Europe, the, uh, the, 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 the rise of extreme right is more and more focusing of, on lack of public services, lack of jobs, lack of economic activities. So if we can manage as Greens, not only to say on climate change, Europe is the only uh, political uh, body now to deal at the global uh, scale against Trump, against Putin, against all the climate skeptics, to deal with climate change, so to put a common good at the international level. But it's not only the issue. The issue is that Greens is offering a positive future for our territories. Not the way the Liberals are thinking the territories, which is either 
it's the center of towns. And this is good, but for rural areas, for small uh, cities, it's a kind of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the rural area are the past, but, not of, uh, but we are fighting also the vision of the extreme right of the uh, territories, which is, you know, back to the 60s. So we are somehow through climate change, through what we are gaining in the European Parliament, we are somehow uh, developing from territories an open society. An open society because people are taking over control of their lives, they are taking over control of their local communities, they are building new links to others, new relationships to others, and this is why climate change is at the core of our program. This is why we can bring this issue as a way also to make a European revolution from inside. And just to finish, the way, I mean, we have all these marches on climate everywhere. We have all the communities, all uh, companies also, uh, local authorities fighting for climate change. So we should remain always inspired by what others are doing. But because we are acting, we are not just observing, we are not just commenting what is uh, going on. We are acting on the reality. We are part of a movement which should inspire the voters, which should inspire all European citizens. And if we can do that, I mean, next time we'll come, we'll talk about 20, 30 percent of our job when we talk about successes. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick. Then uh, I would like uh, to um, ask a question to Monica. Monica, she is uh, vice president of our group, and she is uh, practically the person which uh, we have to be very, very careful every time we are discussing about gender equality. Uh, Monica, she is a kind of thermometer, if ever in no amendment or in uh, a proposal or in a text or whatever, there is not enough attention on gender equality, we know that we will have a problem, and that is Monica. So, an applause uh, to her, because even if we are practically <laughs> Greens, not everybody has the same culture and you really need to have some progressive women in order to remind us permanently how important it is to fight and to promote gender uh, equality. Then uh, I would like to ask you what are your main achievements around uh, this area and uh, uh, your, uh, the way also that in your campaign you will uh, uh, practically promote your successes around this area. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vula, also for the compliment. Uh, indeed, I think uh, we all know that uh, gender issues, women's rights, the fight for equality is in the core of our work, not only within the European Greens, but especially uh, within our group in the European Parliament. And one characterism of our work in the European Parliament on gender issues is that Women don't work alone on that. We work together with men and our delegation, for example, in the FAM committee, where the women's rights are negotiated, is a delegation of women and men because I fundamentally believe that the fight for gender equality is not only a task of women, it's a task for the whole society. And there are many, many men, especially in our group, that take up this fight together with us. As you and also Philippe <laughs> Thank you. has already mentioned that we are not the biggest group in the European Parliament, not at all. But I think given our size, we have many, many achievements, especially also in the field of gender equality, because on the one hand, we have a very good cooperation um, between the 
progressive forces in the parliament. And on the other hand, and I think this is very important also for our election campaign, we have the deepest cooperation with the civil society, with the NGOs, with the resistance on the ground, and there is so much resistance on the ground. And and I think also as Judith and others have mentioned, we feel this backlash in the European Parliament, these anti-democratic forces every time, every day. And we must not underestimate that. And you know, one characterism of the rise of the right wing and right wing parties and right wing populists in general is that the first thing that are going to attack are gender rights, LGBTIQ rights and uh, democratic rights. And I think the Greens are really in the forefront in the European Parliament to look at the rule of law and to uh, stabilize our democracy. Uh, one of our biggest successes, as you asked, uh, Vula, in this is, um, on the one hand, I think it's the pressure of the Greens, or it was the pressure of the, of the Greens, that the European Commission signed the Istanbul Convention uh, against violence against women, a step that the member states did not take all the 28, so we have a lot of work ahead of us. And another uh, big issue for Terry Reinke and me was when the Me Too uh, movement came up and these horrible cases of sexual harassment within the European Parliament also, we managed almost overnight to get 580 MEPs in this house for a zero tolerance resolution on sexual harassment. And I think this is really an achievement also due to a very good cross-party cooperation. So uh, last but not least, I would like uh, to uh, say a few words uh, uh, for Bart Stas from uh, um, Belgium. Uh, I was discussing yesterday with him and uh, I must say that I even forgot how many um, times we have been and for how many years you have been a uh, um, uh, member of the European Parliament. I mean, maybe probably <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I mean, we, we, also me, I'm several years there, but I really forgot. And the fact that I forgot is a very good signal because Bart, he never, but never lost, uh, lost uh, energy and uh, the political driving and the enthusiasm to really push uh, several issues, not only around the Budget Control Committee, but several important issues in the Environment Committee, and especially when it comes to the food campaign. I have a good memory, by the way, but the fact that I forget means that uh, really I never saw the, the, the persistence and the, uh, and, and the commitment really to put forward important issues for us yeah. as fighting against the GMOs for food quality, fighting the pesticides, and now he is the rapporteur of a special committee which we as Greens and our MEPs, they managed to put in place the pesticide committee, inquiry committee, which is a very, very big achievement. And we have the rapporteur, which is Bart Stas. Then Bart, first an applause, and then we would like really to know, thank you, to know, from you about, uh, about your report on the pesticides and also uh, what are practically your predictions for the outcome of this vote, which is quite important. And uh, it will be, of course, as we said before, a big achievement thanks to the Greens in the European Parliament. Thank you, Vula, for your very kind words. Um, kind. You're not always kind, that's true. Um, pesticides glyphosate, uh, bee-killing insecticides such as uh, neonicotinoids. That are the issues where we as Greens make the difference. We managed to destroy the proposal of the European Commission to authorize glyphosate for another 15 years. 
Now it's five years, and the debate will start again. The debate will start again by the end of next year because Monsanto and the other companies will have to ask for a new renewal by the end of next year. So we have to be vigilant. We managed to ban the neonicotinoids. We managed, and when we talk about this, this is about protecting people. This is about protecting health. This is about protecting animals. This is about protecting the environment. This is about looking and making sure that we have healthy soils. So we have to go for another kind of agriculture. And it was because of the glyphosate case that we as a group managed to create that special committee. An enormous task. I am the rapporteur together with a German conservative. And nevertheless, by the end of September last, a few months ago, we managed to, to table a resolution, a report whereby our allies already say, this is going in the right direction. This is guaranteeing more transparency. This is guaranteeing independent science. This is guaranteeing another kind of making, of, of making decisions. But of course, the enemies are all around. On the 65 paragraphs we tabled, I got 1,141 amendments, most of them written at the headquarters of the pesticides industry. I am now talking with the other colleagues, and I hope by the 6th of December to deliver 57, 58 compromise amendments so that we can deliver a good result on the 6th of December. If we manage to do so, best friends, we do that because we connect to people. We do not work solely in the European Parliament. We invest in expertise. We invest in people. We connect to people. We connect to the civil society. We connect to our colleagues in the NGOs. And that makes that we play on a weight much above our weight of 6 7% in the European Parliament. We managed to, to vote resolutions in the European Parliament on GMOs with two-third majorities. This shows that we, as the European group, the Green European group, on our key issues, we are simply the best. Wonderful. So I have really to excuse myself because we will not be able to take some questions because there is a pressure to deliver also for the next plenary. But I would like to give uh, the floor to Philippe to, with the conclusive uh, remarks of our session. And of course, you will have the opportunity to meet our MEPs, but not only who are on the panel, but we have several MEPs present in, uh, in this room. Uh, and you will have the opportunity in the coming hours to really uh, talk to them and to continue the discussion. Philip. Thank you, Vula. So, you know what it's all about. We know what we fight for. We have a clear compass. We want every human being now and in the future to live a fulfilling life. So, we are dedicated to that. Second, you've seen we know our stuff. We work, and work does make a difference. Third, we are not afraid. Fear is not what drives us. What drives us is hope. Fourth, we never, we never ever give up. That's about enthusiasm, that's about persistence. But as Bert said, we're six or seven percent of the European Parliament, and we know that what is at stake is the future of humanity, and size matters. So we are doing all this with 6 or 7% of the European Parliament. Just imagine that we would be 10, 15, 20% of the European Parliament. Just imagine that we would have two, three, four, five green commissioners. Just imagine that we would have one quarter of the European governments where greens play a pivotal role. Just imagine what would change. That's what is at stake in the European election next year, so you know what's left for us to do.